All right, good evening, everyone. Welcome both live and uh, and we're going virtual here as well. So I'm Dr. Raymond Thal. I'm one of the uh, sports medicine orthopedic surgeons here at Washington Sports Medicine Institute. So I appreciate everyone uh, attending both live and virtual for our first of a series of lectures uh, to the general public, both again, live and virtual. Uh, the purpose of this lecture series is to provide a format to discuss musculoskeletal uh, topics to our community. So before I introduce our speaker for tonight, I thought I would just say a few words about Washington Sports Medicine Institute. Uh, the, the Sports Medicine Center here is a center of excellence that was established by Ortho Bethesda. Ortho Bethesda, as many of you know, is a leading orthopedic uh, uh, group in the Mid-Atlantic region and has a very long and respected history. Uh, over the past several years, Ortho Bethesda has experienced tremendous growth and they've aligned with several orthopedic groups in the region and in the process have developed centers of excellence, the Sports Medicine Center being one. And we've brought in uh, several uh, noted sports medicine specialists to establish this center of excellence. Um, while our emphasis is for active in, or treating active individuals, uh, we do provide treatment for a range, of, a full range of orthopedic services from sports medicine, pediatrics, uh, spine, joint, joint replacement, hand and, and upper extremity injuries. Um, I'll introduce a few of our uh, uh, surgeons who are attending, Dr. Lonnie Davis, who's also a sports medicine uh, orthopedic surgeon. Uh, some others will be joining, and I'll give you a, a more um, in-depth introduction in a moment to Dr. Bruner. Um, from a logistics standpoint, as much of this uh, is uh, many of the people attending are, are attending virtually, if you have questions virtually, please enter them into the chat. And Dr. Davis will be our chat master this evening. He will uh, write down the questions and present them to Dr. Gunner at the end. Anyone live, of course, feel free to just raise your hand at the end, and Dr. Gunner will entertain any questions. So tonight's um, speaker is Dr. Mark Gruner. Uh, he'll be speaking tonight about a very uh, popular topic, something we all get a lot of questions about when we're seeing patients about uh, speaking about regenerative medicine. Um, Dr. Gruner is a Washington, D.C. native. Uh, and sports medicine physiatrist who's part of the practice here at Washington Sports Medicine Institute. And we're very pleased to have him as a, a member of our team. He attended Virginia Tech for his uh, joint medical and business degree, and then did a residency at Georgetown University. He then completed a uh, sports medicine fellowship at the prestigious Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. Uh, he is also chief medical officer at, uh, of Limber Health, where he lectures nationally on orthopedic value-based care. Dr. Gruner specializes in the prevention and treatment of non-operative sports uh, medicine injuries. Uh, he is trained with leading experts at the Mayo Clinic and elsewhere in ultrasound and regenerative medicine, uh, where he will discuss those topics today. So without further ado, it's my great pleasure to introduce my friend and colleague, Dr. Gruner. Thanks, appreciate it. Well, thank you guys. You know, the, the goal of today's uh, conversation is to really just give you guys a quick background on myself, what I what I do, and what's really unique about uh, WSMI. But just a brief background, uh, like uh, Dr. Thal said, I was born and raised in Bethesda. Previously, I was a personal trainer and grew up here, played uh, high school and collegiate basketball um, in the area. Um, and then uh, one of the things that... Uh, I have that's really unique that we'll talk a lot about today is a, a certification in diagnostic ultrasound, and that's called the RMSK. And so um, it enables me to use a machine like this to, to look at soft tissue structures and tell you right there in the clinic if that, that area where you're, you're hurting is actually, do you have a tear or if there's an injury there? Next slide. So, um, Dr. Thal and Dr. Davis really brought together a really special group of uh, doctors from uh, really around the entire DC area to, to contribute to uh, sports medicine. And one of the things that I love about this, this group is it's multidisciplinary. I will, I will talk to them every day about a unique case and we'll try to collaborate in different ways to figure out what's best for the patient. Um, it's a one-stop shop. We have physical therapy here, sports performance, um, uh, x-rays on site, ultrasound, regenerative medicine, 
And uh, really, this was uh, something I saw when I was at Mayo Clinic, where it was a multidisciplinary center, uh, all working together to try to get the patient as uh, healthy and uh, back to healing as, as fast as possible. Next slide. So the goal of today is we're going to focus on re reviewing uh, a little bit about sports medicine and physiatry services, which is I'm a physiatrist. Secondly, we'll just go over just some, uh, you know, the philosophy that I have about evidence-based practice of medicine and how to manage MSK conditions. And so some tips and tricks uh, for good old uh, sports medicine prevention. And then we'll go into some of these innovative uh, approaches and uh, review some of the evidence. Um, the, the last thing we'll just talk about uh, the use of diagnostic ultrasound and how we're using it for some injections too. So the first thing um, about physiatry, so I really focus on non-surgical care and some of these minimally invasive treatments uh, and regenerative medicine and really studying them and making sure that it's done from uh, an evidence-based perspective and that uh, it's done well and it's done by what we what we review in the literature. And in addition to um, thinking about some of the procedures, I think it's always good to know that I, I start off with good old conservative treatment, getting a, a really good diagnosis, either with the use of ultrasound or, uh, and a, a good clinical history and an exam. Um, also working with my physical therapy colleagues, we have one of our physical therapy colleagues here today, uh, really focusing on strengthening the muscle to take pressure off the injured the joint. Then we also really focus on nutrition, um, thinking about uh, items like turmeric for arthritis that can be helpful, and then prevention. How can we prevent the injury from ever happening? Um, what we'll focus on today also that a physiatrist uh, uses is a diagnostic ultrasound in the clinic to provide some of these minimally basic procedures that I learned at Mayo Clinic, and we'll talk more about them. So the first thing is good old practice. What is the, the 11 best recommendations that, that every uh, person in the community should know about uh, managing MSK uh, conditions? So the, uh, if you want to go to the next slide. So I won't highlight all of them, but the biggest ones is that it's always important to get a really good diagnosis. and the second thing is to make sure that we always screen patients for red flags. So if there's something emergent, that's where a doctor is really thinking in their head, you know, what is the, the, the most serious thing that could be happening? And if it is emergent, we make sure that we get a proper imaging, but not to order imaging too soon and try to focus on good old physical therapy to try to strengthen those muscles. Um, I, the other thing that's really important uh, when they talk about the top recommendations is collecting outcome measures. And why that's really important and what we do that I think is really unique in this area is we use uh, a registry called Patient IQ. And so every procedure that we're doing, whether it's a regenerative medicine procedure or a surgery, we're collecting outcomes so we can track longitudinally how patients are doing for research, but also for, for knowing what works and what doesn't work. So you can really know when you come to WSMI, you're gonna get outcome measures that are surveys that patients can see that just like blood pressure, we can track scores over time to see how you're improving, which I think is really important. And that's an important thing that you should think about when you're trying to see an orthopedic provider. The next thing that uh, every doc in this practice really focuses on is making sure that patients stay active. And so although a lot of us are sports medicine physicians, we don't just take care of athletes, we take care of anyone that wants to exercise. And I think one of the, the key components of that is making sure that, that we go over physical activity and return to play criteria so you can feel safe about going back to the sports that you love so much. Um, so those are just some of the, the recommendations that yeah. as a physician that we're always trying to follow and we really try to, to take that to heart here at WSMI. So now we're gonna head into some of the newer procedures that I offer in the clinic. Um, all these are done. Um, uh, we don't need a surgery center. We actually do these in the clinic um, in just some of our procedure rooms that we have. So we're going to go over tendon scraping, a uh, procedure called 10X that was invented at Mayo Clinic, uh, a carpal tunnel release that was invented at, at Mayo Clinic, uh, a procedure called a trigger finger release, capture distension for frozen shoulder, which we'll go over, and then we'll go over the evidence behind PRP bone marrow 
and adipose, which are some of these regenerative medicine treatments. And then we'll we'll touch base on the diagnostic ultrasound. Yeah. Oh, do you guys mind if uh, you mute the microphone if you guys are on the Zoom? I would uh, appreciate it. Uh, I know that can be uh, hard for some of the other people on the Zoom. So if you if you don't mind muting your microphone, that'd be great. So the first one we're going to talk about is a procedure called tendon scraping. So what is tendon scraping? So um, it's where we, uh, under ultrasound, we'll look at the tendon and see if it's torn or injured and then go between the tendon and the fat pad to try to separate the areas where some of the inflammation can happen. So next slide. And so you wanna play the video? Yeah. yeah. So uh, do you have the scanner? Oh, the, oh, the laser, the laser pointer. Oh, here. Sorry. So this is the kneecap. And see these uh, vessels here, that's called neovessels. That's what we think is, is uh, the pain generator that causes inflammation for patients. And so um, what happens is we can see if someone has a tear or tendonitis, and we can see where that inflammation happens. So one of the things that we can do if the tendon is preserved and it's, it's normal, but there's some of this inflammation that's happening between the tendon and what's, uh, this is a fat pad, we can actually separate those layers and get that, uh, we can do this for athletes or people who don't want to take a long time to recover uh, from a, a tendon treatment. And we just go between the tendon and the fat pad, separating those neovessels, which cause pain for patients. So this is, uh, so we use a, a little tool and we actually just separate those neovessels that you saw before, which cause most of the pain for the patient. So because we don't go in the tendon, people can get go back to activities usually within two to three weeks. Next slide. So the next one we're gonna talk about is 10X. 10X is uh, a procedure that we'll go over in a little bit. It's for tennis elbow, which is on the outside of your elbow, golfer's elbow, patella tendonitis, which is on the kneecap, Achilles tendonitis, which happens to runners, uh, plantar fasciitis, or calcific rotator cuff tendonitis, which is when you get little calcium deposits that happen that that deposit in the in the rotator cuff. So I won't go through the science, but essentially what <clears throat> what happens to tendons is that for some reason, uh, we used to think it was called tendonitis, which is inflammation to the tendon. But what we now know is that from overuse that the tendon actually changes, it causes some degeneration. And for lack of blood supply to the area, um, the tendon just changes from uh, one collagen, which is how the tendon is made, to another collagen. And we know that's a problem. And when we know when we remove a little piece of that collagen, new collagen can form to create the train tracks to allow that tendon to be stronger. Next slide. So there's been a lot of studies about 10X, and I'll show you what that this procedure is. Um, probably over the years, there's probably about 40 different studies showing how it can be effective for those conditions I was showing you. And a lot of times uh, patients will ask, how effective is it? Depending on the body part, it could be anywhere between 85 and 90% uh, effective, depending on how severe the, the tendon is injured. Next slide. So this is just an example. Um, oops, hold on, let me get back. So, so this is just an example where you saw that inflammation like you saw the, the patella, but now it's in the elbow. And um, so this person has some tendonitis or tendinopathy um, in their, their lateral elbow or tennis elbow. The next slide. So if you want to play the video. So what we do is we make a little incision and then under ultrasound, we'll actually uh, look at where the tendon is torn or injured. And we can see this uh, in the clinic. And then we use a special instrument to go to the area where the tendon is injured. And then we remove that degenerated portion of the tendon while preserving the rest of the tendon above. And then it will, will uh, actually get, uh, some of the injured tendon will get uh, brought up into this uh, aspiration tube here to the right. Next 
minutes. All right. So, oops. You guys here? All right. So, a lot of times people ask, well, how, how effective, what is the evidence about this? How effective is it? This was a study done by a shoulder and elbow surgeon that may have. Um, no. All right. <laughs> Sorry. It's loose. That's relaxing. Yeah, I like that. I like that. All right. So um, this was showing how effective it was at three years. And what I really like about this, uh, next slide. What I really like about this study that uh, one of the Mayo physicians uh, 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 did was that, so you can see here, so black is bad on, on ultrasound. And you can see that this person had that, that inflammation and they had a tear. And then they did the procedure and then you can see what it looks like three months, it's starting to fill in, six months, and then three years. And then they actually correlated those images and the pain score and the function score. And so you can see people, uh, have pain that were five or six out of 10 on average would go down to zero out of 10. And it gets better over time as the tendon fills in. Next slide. So some people will ask, well, should I consider PRP or 10X for my tendon injury? And there's different uh, thought processes here, but the way we did it at Mayo Clinic, which is the way uh, I practice here, is that if, if the tendon's torn, um, we'll consider PRP, usually first line. If there's it's more than just tendonitis, then we'll consider the 10X. Um, a lot of times uh, we find that PRP can be equally effective to, to 10X, and this was a study done at Emory University showing effectiveness for them. Next slide. Um, some people ask, how is it compared to surgery? Well, first of all, if you don't have improvement with this, you can always get the surgery. Uh, but this was a study done out of Tulane University showing 10X to be helpful and an alternative to surgery. So the next one we're going to talk about is calcific tendonitis. So that was that calcium deposit you see on this x-ray that develops. We don't know the reason why, but it develops in patients' rotator cuff. And so you can imagine every time you lift your arm up, that calcium deposit is causing it to bend. Well, under ultrasound, we can actually take out that calcium deposit, removing the impingement and allowing the shoulder to move more freely, which causes the pain that people will get in their shoulder sometimes. Next slide. If you want to play the video. So you can see here, we use a, a special needle and we actually go into the middle of the calcium deposit. We can actually take that calcium deposit out under ultrasound. So this can be done in the clinic and, and it's pretty easy. And people can get back to activity pretty quickly. Next slide. The next procedure we're gonna talk about is something that I think has been really exciting to, 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 to offer to patients. It's a surprise what the next one's gonna be. Because we just lost our slides. So the next one's for uh, carpal tunnel syndrome. So I don't know if anyone's heard of carpal tunnel syndrome, but uh, sometimes you can get numbness and tingling in your first three fingers. It bothers you at night. Sometimes you you you, know, you knock your hand out to try to get rid of the numbness and tingling. And it's due to a nerve called the median nerve that gets pinched in the wrist. And when that nerve gets pinched, it actually can cause swelling of the nerve, which you can see under ultrasound, and we'll, we'll show you what that nerve looks like. And then if it gets pinched for a long period of time, people can get weakness, uh, pain in their, their wrist and hand. And usually um, you would wanna go to a physical therapist first and try some nerve glide exercises. Sometimes you can try bracing at night. When that doesn't work, you can try an injection. Um, some people will do a steroid injection under ultrasound or just a, an injection overall. And then if you still have pain, then there's three surgeries that can be done. There's the open surgery, which they can do, which is they, they cut that, this ligament that's causing the, the nerve to be pinched. Um, or you can do this endoscopically where they make a little incision in the wrist, or you can do it under ultrasound where you make another incision in the wrist. 
And so this is the ultrasound guided approach that we actually can offer in the office for patients without any general anesthesia. Screen sharing is still. Yeah. Oh, man. <clears throat> oh. Let me get back up. Yeah, I don't think anyone else can see. So if that's the screen that's being shared, do we want to go to the slide? Yeah. yeah, I think you'd have to go to the Zoom share. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, here. Sure. We're having some, this is our first lecture series, so there's some technical difficulties. I apologize. So, if we really have any questions while we're trying to get everything else on? Oh, yeah. yeah, it's a really good question. Depends on your insurance. 10x uh, can be covered by your insurance depending yes. on uh, several factors. Uh, PRP uh, is $1,000 in our practice. Um, it's not covered by insurance. It's covered with some insurances, but most mm -hmm. insurance is not covered. Um, but uh, I think, you know, there's the studies I'll show you today, I think there's going to be more and more uh, insurances uh, covering it now because for certain conditions, mm -hmm. which I think is really important. Mark, can you repeat the question for the yeah. uh, so members can't hear the, when the question is asked? So oh, repeat it okay. It's okay. Yeah. So one of the questions that uh, someone asked was about PRP and the cost. And uh, we'll, I have a slide and we'll get to that uh, pretty soon. Give me a second. Any other questions in the audience at this point? All right, we got another question. Where are we going? Uh, I think we need to talk about tendon scraping. Compare it to a two week recovery versus a six week recovery. Yeah. Why would somebody opt to be miserable for six weeks if two weeks is there? Because a lot of people aren't candidates for the tendon oh, scraping because the tendon, oh, sorry. The question was, uh, why would someone opt for the tendon scraping versus the tendon procedure? And the, the reason why is when you have the tendon that's injured, um, uh, you have to get the, the longer recovery uh, procedure versus when the tendon's normal and, and you just have some inflammation that's going on, then you could be a candidate. So it's not for every person that they would be a candidate for that procedure. But I agree with you. You'd want to do the one that gets you back to the activities that you love a lot faster. No, and we'll get, we're gonna get to some of that, um, but bone on bone arthritis of the knee is, uh, uh, we'll, we'll get to some of that soon. And uh, I think we the question it. was what, what, uh, about bone on bone arthritis and we'll get to that uh, very so soon. All right, let's jump over the video. Let's, yeah. So this is the procedure where under ultrasound, we'll see where the nerve is. We'll see how swollen it is. And I'll show you guys that today. And then we'll make a little incision here. And then under ultrasound, we'll take um, a device which has a balloon. And then we'll separate that balloon under ultrasound. And then that push, pushes the nerve in the artery, and only when that's uh, pushed out, then we'll, we'll cut the ligament under ultrasound. And we can do this in the clinic, which is the surgery that you can get for carpal tunnel surgery. So if you go to Mayo Clinic, this is what most patients are getting today for carpal tunnel surgery. If they're a candidate, not everyone is a candidate for this. Thanks. All right. So. A lot of people ask, what's the evidence for this? So there, this is a study done at, at Jefferson University showing uh, that it was safe and there's long-term treatment options for it. And then uh, there was another study done in the journal of hand surgery showing very good results for 
carpal tunnel, ultrasound guide carpal tunnel surgery. Not a number. Right. So the next one is something that we'll do, which is uh, sometimes people have pain in their in their finger here, and it's due to a pulley that gets thickened called a trigger finger. I don't know if you've ever heard of that, but uh, it's very common to have these trigger fingers. Sometimes in addition to pain, you can have locking of the fingers. And uh, it happens to people who do a lot of manual work. Um, and so what happens here is that this pulley gets thickened. And so uh, sometimes we'll do an injection. If that's not effective, um, then the next thing will be called a trigger finger release. And so this is something that we, uh, there's been many studies that came out recently, but essentially what we do is that this is the tendon and then this is the pulley up here. And we use a special needle um, and we can actually release that pulley under ultrasound guidance. And it's, it's very effective for trigger fingers that are having locking of their fingers. So the next thing we'll talk about is something called frozen shoulder. I'm just gonna pause this. So I'll go back. Yeah. Well, I'll just let it play, I guess. You want to just press it? Oh, there you go. I'll let the video start for this. Sorry. This is actually the of Sammy, Lamagain, and Gary, which goes directly into the shoulder joint, your ultrasound guidance. Great the up and beat it and take the joint down. This patient is doing physical therapy, but we're seeing limited improvement. Recording in progress. So she had more range of motion. Can we can see I'll explain this. Please. Please. So she couldn't tie her bra, which is a very common thing for frozen shoulders. This technique is used in conjunction with physical therapy, part of our integrated medical practice. All us today all good. So why I really like that procedure is because I get really good outcomes for it. And it's for patients who happens to, to be of all ages, but um, tends to be middle age to, to later age, happens more to women. And for some reason, the capsule which surrounds their shoulder just gets frozen. And we don't know the exact why, but there's some type of inflammation that can uh, cause the, the capsule to be frozen. So we actually put some fluid under ultrasound into the shoulder. And then we range them in the clinic doing just some mobility. And then uh, I send them to our, phys our physical therapy colleagues and they work on uh, improving your range of motion for two weeks. And most patients that can't even move their arm or tie their bra can actually go back to most of their activities uh, pain-free. How long does that last? It's a permanent uh, item. So oh, it is permanent. It's a permanent uh, item. So usually one procedure and they're, they're doing pretty well. Uh, we're, we're good right now. We're, we're good right now. We're good right now. Yeah, thank you. yeah, thank you. So the next thing we're going to talk about, which is I think what a lot of people wanted to hear about, was uh, uh, what are different treatment options for hip and knee arthritis. So one in two Americans are going to have some type of arthritis that's developing in their body, and that's normal. That's part of getting older and older. And I would say I have some arthritis in my knee, and that's just what happens is the early processes of inflammation in your knee. Now, there's the first step is going to physical therapy, optimizing your nutrition, having a good healthy body weight, and strengthening those muscles, take pressure off the knee, and continuing the exercise. But the next option is getting a, a hip or knee replacement, which is a very effective uh, procedure for a vast majority of patients. But between Hip and knee replacement and physical therapy, there's a treatment gap. And today we'll talk about some of the different treatment options that exist for that. And those include some injections. So uh, first of all, this is someone who has severe bone-on-bone -bone arthritis in their hip. And this is severe arthritis uh, for their knee. Regenerative medicine is not good for severe bone-on-bone -bone arthritis. It's really good to help preventing uh, and, and hopefully managing Arthritis before it gets to bone on bone arthritis. Sure. 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 Oh. Okay. So, we're going to talk about two treatment options. The first one's called PRP, platelet rich plasma. That's where we take your blood, it's very safe, and we spin it down and we get platelets that we'll talk about. 
And the second one are called stem cells. And we'll talk about where you get most of these stem cells. So the first one, PRP. So what is this? So uh, essentially what happens is we take your blood, we take a, the same amount of blood that you get during uh, uh, any lab testing that you've done. And then we get the platelets, which is the Buffy coat. And those platelets have growth factors that help with healing a lot longer than a traditional steroid injection. And so we spin those platelets down uh, in the clinic the same day. And then once we get those platelets, we use this for treating many different conditions. We use it for tendonitis, arthritis, muscle injuries, and ligament injuries. But what is the science about all, all this? So we'll, we'll start off with arthritis. So um, the first stages of arthritis is that you get some inflammation that causes the cartilage to break down. So before you get bone-on-bone -bone arthritis, usually you get some inflammation that happens in the joint. And that in inflammation is one of the things that PRP treats, which is the growth factors help uh, are anti-inflammatory for the, the, the items that are causing inflammation. The second thing it does is it, it has signals it sends to the cartilage on how to preserve the rest of the cartilage. And I'll, I'll, I'll touch base on that. The other thing that we know now about PRP, because it's been uh, used for a while, it's very safe. It's your own body's platelets. So a lot of people will ask me, well, you know, what is the evidence behind this? And I would say the evidence is still evolving for many conditions. It does not grow cartilage. So that's what everyone should know, that it does not grow cartilage. But PRP can be used um, and most of the studies that have been showing really good effects, and I'll go over those, and the, uh, the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons have talked about what uh, uh, body parts are, have been really effective. Most of the studies have been on the knee. And so these were two large studies that were level one, meaning that the doctor didn't know what treatment they had and the patient didn't know what treatment they had. And it showed very good results for mild to moderate arthritis of using PRP for improving your pain and improving your function. These were some other studies that, that showed uh, PRP versus another injection called gel injections, which you guys have probably heard of called hyaluronic acid. And it showed that PRP was more effective than the hyaluronic acid. And another study showed that uh, PRP versus uh, uh, does it delay the need for knee surgery? So this was a huge uh, study that looked at people over time and it showed that it can delay the need for knee surgery by anywhere between two to five years. Um, and 75% of people, depending on if they had mild to moderate arthritis, delay, delayed the need for a knee, sur uh, knee replacement. And this was study was done out of, out of Hopkins in the Journal of uh, Medicine. And, it, and they only looked at double-blind randomized control studies, so the highest evidence that we have to date in medicine. And they showed that PRP had significant advantages in improving pain and function. So all these uh, pretty good studies, I think, have been done for PRP. Um, one of the surgeons who's really well-known in, in the area in Chicago um, did a study showing what is, is PRP cost-effective? And so if PRP can improve someone's pain and function, and it can improve it um, for at least a year, the, the quality of life cost was about $1,200. And so PRP here costs about $1,000 for us. And that's, that's how, um, you know, there's many reasons. Uh, many people will charge a whole bunch of factors, but if, if, if it lasts a year, I think that's a reasonable amount of, uh, for, for improvement for a patient. So the next thing we'll talk about is tendonitis. So we talked about arthritis, we'll talk about tendonitis. So this is a study done at Stanford University. Um, it was really well done by the orthopedic department. And it showed early on the difference between PRP versus uh, the placebo was, uh, and I think some of them were steroid injection. There was no difference early on, but later on, um, we saw that PRP had a, 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 a more noticeable difference. So PRP ends up, so most people that get PRP for a tendon, they have more pain than they do after the procedure for three days. And that's because it causes some inflammation. And then like a steroid injection will work pretty quickly within seven to 10 days. 
PRP takes three to six weeks to work, and then it can continue to get better each week up to a year. And so it, it works longer and more effective, but it takes a little bit of time for it to work. So this was a patient that came in and had a PRP injection. And I think two months after PRP for her elbow, she's been having pain for over two years now. Um, you might be telling uh, the doctor about how, how you're doing. Right. So I no, no, no. I just uh, left Virginia. So, you know, it's going to be 10, 15 minutes before I get there. Okay. okay. <laughs> yeah, what can I say? All right. Bye bye. So this doesn't happen to everyone, I'll be honest with you, but but she had a really good outcome and a lot of patients can have good outcomes if, if the, you know that you get the, the right diagnosis and you have a, a good conversation about expectations with them. So people are using this for all body parts. People are using it for hair loss. People are using it uh, for facials, for their face. Um, th these were some studies that showed that it was helpful and effective for tendonitis, uh, trochanter bursitis on the, on the outside of your hip, and then also for golfer's elbow. And I would say some areas of the body has been effective and other areas, uh, uh, there's been studies showing that Your it hasn't been effective. So the research is still evolving and we're trying to figure this out. So we talked about arthritis. I, I really think uh, I'll go through a couple more studies at the end, but it, it, we know that it can be effective. We know it doesn't regrow cartilage and it can help improve your pain and function for at least a year. For tendonitis, it works longer term. Usually one injection, it can be a long-term treatment options for patients. So the next thing we'll talk about is stem cells. I would say the first thing that everyone should know about stem cells is that this is more experimental. We don't know a lot of, uh, there hasn't been a lot of great research yet, but there's been some promising research and we'll talk about these. The, the other thing about stem cells is it has the promise for hopefully providing some regeneration but that's been done in animal models, hasn't been proven in human models yet. So there's two places where we get stem cells. We get them from your bone and we get them from your back. And those stem cells can help with differentiation of tissue, which we'll talk a little bit about. So we talked about the bone marrow, so we can get it from your bone, usually we get it from the back of your pelvis, or we get it from your fat, usually we get it from the, the fat in the back or on the side of, of your belly. And so um, these were some of the studies. So I, I became interested in some of the adipose stem cells from my uncle. He's a physicist at Cornell. And uh, they did a lot of the, the stem cell procedures on horses there. And he had it done for himself. It was extremely effective for him for arthritis, for, for knee and shoulder arthritis. And um, I became interested in this when I was at Mayo Clinic, where we were doing a lot of research on regenerative medicine. These were some recent studies that I thought were helpful. So this was a study done at, at Rothman in Philadelphia, which is a prestigious orthopedic. The time is eight, right? And it was a double-blind, prospective, randomized control study showing that adipose, the fat stem cells, improve pain and function pretty uh, considerably. There was a large effect of improvement in those patients. And then this one followed patients up for about three years and showed good improvement. So early studies, but there's not a lot of studies yet. This was done by the, the USC Department of Orthopedics and showed that stem cells were safe and there was generally positive clinical outcomes. And then this was a study done at Emory University showed that, that uh, adipose stem cells the, was very helpful um, in many different their, of their clinic sites. And it, it was good for mild to moderate arthritis and it was good for patients over the age of 60. So this was one of the first studies that looked at older patients and was this effective for patients. So um, I would say the stem cells are more experimental. Going back to PRP, there's been two uh, hallmark consensus statements that I think are really important that the public should know about them. 
The first one came from the NBA um, and they came, uh, you know, an NBA athlete's gonna get a, a procedure. They wanna make sure there's good evidence to support that. And they went through all the body parts and they recommend it now for knee arthritis and patellar tendonitis were the, the big ones that they recommend. I also think tennis elbow is a, a really solid one, but other ones, they couldn't recommend it yet. But the PRP was uh, something that they recommend for their athletes for knee arthritis and patellar And then the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeon, if anyone's interested in this, I, they put together a fantastic technology over you. It's, I think it's over 50 pages uh, if you want some boring reading at night. But uh, essentially, they went through all the studies for PRP for the knee, and they re they recommend it now as a, a treatment option for patients for improving pain and function compared to the other treatment options. What's really important is that these things don't get you better overnight, and you really have to have good rehab, working with our physical therapy partners to strengthen your body and get your body ready after the injection, which is an important part of recovery and rehab. And I've written a lot of uh, articles talking about the rehab process after a regenerative medicine procedure, which is really, really important. Um, and it, it take, can take six to 12 weeks for tendons. For joints, most people are going back to activity in, in three to four weeks. So last things I'll just talk about is diagnostic ultrasound. We talked a lot of the procedures. I think that's fun and important, but I, what's really unique and differentiated here is we do a lot of diagnostic ultrasound. So we use it for the shoulder to see if there's a rotator cuff tear. We'll do it for the elbow to see if they have tennis elbow. We'll do it for the wrist, which we'll show you today to see if they have carpal tunnel syndrome. We'll do it for their hip to do an accurate hip joint injection, or we'll do it for the, their glute tendons. We'll do it for their knee to remove some swelling from their knee or look to see if they have patellar tendonitis. And then we'll look at their Achilles and, and their plantar fascia sometimes too. So there's just some common uh, use cases of that. And this is what it kind of looks like. So this is white, and this is a normal rotator cuff tendon. Uh, this, and then this is a normal biceps tendon. It's white, very solid. What you can see about ultrasound is uh, this is that biceps tendon. It became really large, and there was some tearing in there. And then you can see when with ultrasound, which you can see with dynamic movement, you can see that there's uh, uh, that biceps tendon can can slip out of its groove, which can cause some some feeling of instability in that patient. Yeah. Yeah. Any questions? We have to take a quick pause. Yeah. Yeah, great, great question. Um, so the question was, is there any uh, diagnostic ultrasound for the spine? I do not do any of that. I don't uh, work in the low back or the neck area. I'm sure there are some doctors, but the spine is really deep, and usually ultrasound is probably not the most effective diagnostic tool. A lot of physical therapists use the ultrasound in the spine to see if the muscles are activating or firing. And um, they might not look to see if there's an injury to the spine, but they might use it for um, uh, to, to, to help for the rehab process. And dry needle. And dry needle. Yeah, thanks. Are we back at it? Yeah. So in this picture, I'll just tell you real quick, we saw that a nice white tendon in the rotator cuff tendon, now you see it's black. We know that that, that tendon is torn and, and can tell the surgeon right away that, that it needs to be fixed quickly. So um, how accurate is ultrasound to MRI? It's very accurate if you have someone that is certified in the diagnostic part of it, which is that RMSK certification I have, and it's equal to MRI. Um, and we write reports on, on if the tendons are torn uh, for rotator cuff tears. And this is just one uh, study comparing it to MRI. So I won't go through anything else, but um, I would just say that there, there have been some studies about ultrasound guided injections be very effective and, and accurate. And, I, and that's something that's really important. But this study just quickly was a study done at Mayo and they did an ultrasound guided gel injection, which is that hyaluronic acid versus a, 
uh, injection done uh, without ultrasound. And they showed, they followed these pa patients out for over 10 years and, and saw which patients needed a knee replacement. And they showed that the ultrasound was very helpful for, for uh, delaying the need for a knee replacement for gel injections. And so um, I do think that uh, uh, ultrasound has its place and its role. And uh, my goal here is just to, to talk with you guys about some of these newer treatment options and diagnostic tools that we're using. And uh, we're really excited to, to partner with the community to, to help people get better from their injuries at WSMI. If you have any questions, you can just email me here or um, uh, that number is our number for scheduling an appointment. I'll answer some questions and then uh, Nikki, did you mind making the switch to the carpal tunnel? So we'll, we'll do a, a quick carpal tunnel scan and then just answer any questions from the group. Can we throw a couple of questions from the audience? Yeah. Uh, this is exactly, you know, Thanks. Uh, so the first question was, like, uh, you said that the tendon scraping is for those who want a quicker recovery than traditional therapy, or what is the tra traditional therapy that you generally recommend for that? Yeah, so once again, uh, the question was, Tendon scraping, is it more effective than traditional therapy? So the answer is, you know, you always want to try the least invasive thing first to, 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 to before considering any of these other treatments. So it's really important to do the physical therapy, consistently strengthen the muscles, give yourself a chance. Most people will recover with just the therapy alone. If that doesn't do the trick and they're not improving with therapy, then if the tendon is normal, then, uh, but they have some inflammation, that tendon scraping might be an option. Here's another question regarding PRP. Uh, there, there was, the question was, uh, the PRP doesn't regrow cartilage, so how does it actually work for arthritis? Yeah, so the question was, how does PRP work for arthritis if it doesn't regrow cartilage? So we're still learning the entire mechanism. It's very complicated, but the way PRP works is that those growth factors have anti-inflammatory processes to decrease the inflammation in the joint, which is that first part of the arthritis that I told you. And then what happens over time is once the knee yeah, gets inflamed, then it, it, it creeps into the cartilage and then the fluid actually sits in the, in the, in the a, a part of the, the cartilage in the bone called the subchondral bone. And then that causes a cascade of events that causes the cartilage to break down. And the PRP um, decreasing the inflammation in the joint, and also it sends signals to the current cartilage to preserve the current cartilage is the latest theory of how PRP works. All right, I have one practical question. Yeah. Uh, how painful is 10X? Yeah. So the question is, how painful is 10X? So most patients don't even feel too much pain. You can ask some of my assistants. Some patients, do we try to numb you up beforehand? And so, you know, the same local anesthetic that you get at the dentist's office, we just numb that area. And then after we numb that area, you might hear a sound, but you won't uh, actually feel too much pain. There might be a little bit pain here and there, but overall, most patients are say it's, it's pretty well tolerated. All right, those are some of the questions. So I'll just uh, Nagina, uh, who's one of our great medical assistants, offered her wrist. Um, do you have a course of code? No, no. So what we'll, I'll show you guys is, um, so this is, so we're going to have to, um, So what you guys can see here is you can see how well we can see the the you may need to speak up. Yeah, hold on. So you you can see how well we can see all the soft tissue structures. And I'll, I'll go through stru structures a little, a little bit. So just so everyone here knows, so this is her her bone on one side of her wrist. This is her artery. This is the nerve here, and then. You can actually see that this is the median nerve that gets swollen. The one way that you can actually diagnose carpal tunnel 
is you just um, can actually, uh, in addition to having a good history or a good physical exam, you just press, uh, uh, you can look at that nerve. And I told you the nerve gets swollen and big when it gets pinched. So you just go here and then you can just circle around the nerve to see if it's swollen. And then you can see that the genome doesn't have carpal tunnel, it's six millimeters. So we know how many millimeters the nerve is swollen if the person has carpal tunnel. You can also see um, how that nerve moves. So these are her tendons here. So you want to move your hand again? So we can see what's the, what is the things that are causing the nerve to be pinched and swollen. You want to move your finger or something? And so these tendons are just some examples of things that we can see under ultrasound. So we can look at tendons, we can look at nerves, we can diagnose if they have carpal tunnel, and we can do that in the office, which is really nice. And using really advanced machines like this, we can see just as well as an MRI. Oh, that's a little better. So here's that nerve, here's that artery, and so we can actually see that a lot of structures under all of them. We can diagnose tendonitis. We can diagnose the nerve if it's injured. We can do procedures to avoid the artery and the nerve, which are very close. And, so, and we can actually make sure that we get a really good uh, injection or procedure done accurately so they can have the most effective treatment. That's just an example of ultrasound and what the experience of someone coming in for carpal tunnel syndrome would have at WSMI. Any other questions? Can you say a little bit more about which of these procedures might cover the questions? Yeah, so um, uh, a lot of the procedures are covered by insurance. Oh, sorry. Uh, the question was which procedures are covered by insurance. So, a lot of the so the diagnostic ultrasound is always covered by insurance. It's significantly cheaper than like an MRI. Um, it's just uh, included in, uh, after your copay for your office visit. A lot of the procedures are covered by insurance. Um, you may not have to pay anything. Depending on your insurance, you might have to pay for some of the devices. Um, and then the regenerative medicine treatments are not covered by insurance. And those are, are out of pocket costs, but can go uh, part of your um, uh, FSA depending on what you have. Yeah. Is there any benefit to pre treatment physical therapy? Yes. So the question is sorry, I always got to answer the question because we got uh, another 30 people that are on Zoom, but. Uh, the question is, is, is pre-treatment physical therapy a good option? And pre-treatment physical therapy is a really good option for most conditions and it's also a really good option for most surgeries. And the reason why is if you can go in stronger before your procedure, you're going to be so much better afterwards. So it's usually good to, to strengthen the body, make sure you get yourself ready for any type of treatment. So you can have a, a, a good optimal outcome later on. Do docs in general recommend it to the patients? I would talk to your physician to, to your physician that, that, you, that, that you talk to. I usually my, my practice, I usually recommend the least invasive things first and trying physical therapy, strengthen the muscles, depending on what the injury is. It's not the, the the option for everyone, but it's usually it's an option I usually recommend for a lot of people. You mentioned that uh, insurance companies were looking at uh, covering PRP for certain things. Do you have any ideas as like when and for what? So the, the one that, that has pulled the needle the, that we know is TRICARE. Um, so TRICARE for the military, they have covered it across the board. And Mayo Clinic, they also covered it for all their employees. Um, but I think it's going to be very, very long before we see commercial insurance covering um, this treatment because there needs to be more evidence and still considered experimental. And TRICARE is still a little military facility. Is that what it is? They want to take good care of the soldiers. That's not right. important. Yeah. 
subscribe. Yeah. Mark, there's a question that came in regarding the use of PRP for amendment and conditions. Mm -hmm. So the question was, there's use of, what is the use of PRP for hand injuries? So um, there isn't much evidence except for thumb arthritis. There's, there's evidence for thumb arthritis to consider PRP. That said, I've done it for other injuries. Um, uh, there's a, a injury called TFCC injury, which is like the meniscus in your hand. Um, I've done it for that. And then also for some, some small partial tears of, of tendons. We'll consider that for, for hand injuries. Um, there hasn't been much uh, other evidence in, in any other conditions in the hand. But for thumb arthritis, there's been two studies today. There was another question regarding pain. Mm -hmm. um, it, um, it's an invention that uh, PRP is very painful in our experience. Is that, is that your case as well in terms of the difference between the PRP and the X regarding pain? Yeah, so the, the question is about P, pain with PRP. So I would say I personally have PRP on my body. Uh, I can tell you that just like what I tell patients, it's normally you have more pain than you do right now for three days, which is part of the inflammatory process that we want to happen. It usually is like a three to four out of 10. Um, that um, usually goes down after the third day and then it feels like what it was before you got the injection and then it takes about three to six weeks for it to start really feeling better and that's an important part of, of how the pain evolved and not everyone is a responder seven around 70 percent of people is usually what i quote will have a good outcome with it today what's really important is not all prp is the same and i want everyone here to know about that what we know right now is for to have good prp you have to get about seven to 10 times the concentration of the platelets. And we have to take out certain cells called neutrophils to make sure that we get um, the, the, the PRP that we think is most effective to date. And so just like you, you take your medicine and you wanna make sure you take the, the, the proper dose to have a good response, you have to have a good amount of platelets to actually get a good response with this. And the other thing is that it can be variable as you, Get older, we know now know that not that 85 year old's platelets are not the same as a 45 year old platelets. So you might need more platelets when you get older than someone who is 45. So that's something uh, that's important to know. And these are all things that we take in consideration. In addition, are you a proper candidate? What is the proper treatment that you should have for the, the, that body part? Um, you understand the expectations of what's going on and making sure that we have the, the, uh, the, the idea of what we think might be the best treatment option. And we measure this in a registry that we collect here using patient IQ, where we collect pain and function. So everyone can know what other people have had uh, and what their experience has been like. You know? um, as far as the teller meniscus, the protocols that you discussed today, is there any value in history? Yeah, so the, the MBA article really uh, laid the, the foundation and several other articles before that for patellar tendonitis. Um, I think there is a role for meniscus and also working with our, our great surgeons here for meniscal repair, but there needs to be more studies in that area to, to show if it can be helpful. Or are we getting close to the yeah. end? I had one other question regarding polyolonic acid and gel infections. Combining that with PRP, you comment on the effectiveness of that combination. Yeah, so that's a really good question. So the question is the effectiveness of combining the, the gel and the PRP. So this is very preliminary. There's not been a lot of studies, but we had a, a, a big registry at Mayo Clinic on this. We studied. PRP, we studied the gel, the hyaluronic acid, and we said PRP plus the gel. So for arthritis, we'll usually recommend PRP plus the gel um, at WSMI because of some of the work that I saw at Mayo Clinic. We don't know why, but there's some type of synergistic effect that 
that got a little bit better in outcomes. And we know that PRP was better than the gel. We know that PRP plus the gel was better than PRP alone. Great. Well, thank you guys. I really appreciate everyone coming. Hopefully, it's a We got wine and cheese if anyone else wants wine and cheese. <laughs> I'm usually I'm usually the hand model, so <laughs>